Amy hungry. Amy scared. Amy jungle. Amy scared. (laughs) Amy sleep. Amy need martini. Ugly lady. Ugly, ugly lady. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but they were sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane came. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash the Gump Mucklebones. Hi, y'all. And Big D Dick Ebert. Good evening. Each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit chatpod.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with a number of wipes each movie takes to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. It's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Chat on TV, where we review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Lovecraft Country, and Watchmen. Find all our information and past episodes at chatpod.com slash TV. And finally, if you like to hang out with us live, Follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, shatpod.com slash Twitch, and our YouTube channel, where we play video games, host watch parties, and edit this podcast live. All that being said, Big D, what movie are we reviewing tonight? Gene, each week, it seems that I'm going to talk about one of our great listeners who has supported us through the years, multiple podcast reviews, uh, a lot of support, and this week is no different. One of our great benefactors is Carlos the Mailman. If you've listened to the podcast long enough, you've definitely heard his his name and his wife, Natasha, who believe is also a male mailman, correct? She's a male woman. Well, I think it's a ma- I think they call them yeah. Male people. Male people. Male people. Milady. Yes, the, the the delivering the most important things that we we need in, in a short period of time. They'll come to our door and they're great. They support us. And recently I I was surprised. I listened to another podcast. It's a podcast called Vintage Video, and they review films from the 80s, but we're talking like obscure early 80s. They're somewhere in the in the Hollywood industry. And I hear this week's commissions for our for our listener, Carlos M. And I was like, that motherfucker, he's cheating on us, but it's great that he is supporting the genre and supporting other podcasts. So I was excited when Carlos and his wife, Natasha, wrote and said, please go back to 1985 and review the fantasy adventure legend. And we should mention that uh, Carlos and Natasha have commissioned multiple films for this month. So this one and the next two uh, were on them, giving us a little bit of flexibility to choose some movies that we wanted. And we're super appreciative of that. Legend is a 1985 dark fantasy adventure directed by Ridley Scott and starring Tom Cruise, Mia Sarah. Tim Curry, Billy Barty, and Annabelle Lanyon. The film revolves around Jack, who must stop the Lord of Darkness, who plots to cover the world with eternal night. Legend failed at the box office, but won the British Society of Cinematographers Award for Best Cinematography and was nominated for multiple awards, Oscar for Best Makeup, Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Film Saturn Award for Best Makeup, BAFTA Awards for Best Costume Design, Best Makeup Artist, and Best Special Visual Effects. So, Ash, Big D, we always ask where you were the first time you saw a movie and what your memories are of it. Ash, we'll start with you. What are your memories of Legend? So, as I shared last week, I've never seen this. Um, I think it's weird, though, like as I'm learning all the different 80s fantasy that I never saw, because like I love fantasy stuff. I love fantasy books. I just finished uh, The Priory of the Orange Tree for the second time. I think fantasy series are really awesome. And I can't understand why as big of a fantasy fan as I am that I've never like, you know, accidentally stumbled upon movies like Legend, but it fell into a black hole among many of the other fantasy things from the 80s that kind of slipped my radar as a kid. I will tell you this, though. The poster for this, incredible. I think it's amazing. I would put it on my wall uh, when I was like a teenager. I mean, maybe not now, but I would have. It's absolutely great. So I was really stoked to watch this one. Yeah, seeing this poster might have helped me note the difference between Legend and Labyrinth as a kid. I thought I had seen this movie, 
Now I know why I got the two mixed up, though, because aside from having similar names, they're pretty similar movies in a weird way. They both have goblins led by flamboyant Englishmen. They both have really neat and unique set design and weird aphibophilic undertones. So there's a little bit of a parallel between this and Labyrinth. So like Gene, uh, I was getting this movie mixed up. I haven't seen it in years. I had seen it growing up. But that the 80s like fantasy genre, they're all easy, like Labyrinth or The Dark Crystal or even The Neverending Story. I know I've seen it, but I couldn't tell you what it was about. So I looked it up. I'm like, it's PG. It's got unicorns. I'm like, maybe because I had watched Goonies with Emma. I said, maybe this will be a good one to sit down and watch with her. Luckily, I watched the trailer and it, it, it told me it was a bad idea. Because within the first couple minutes, there is somebody being flayed. There's fires, there's demon, there's blood. She would have run out of the room screaming. So even though, Carlos, I'm glad you commissioned this, this one was not for the kids. Not that I'm poo-pooing legend here, but I just want to point out, Never Ending Story is in a class of its own. It has the banger of a fucking theme song. Unforgettable. It's the only one of these, I think, that has a, a theme song that belongs on the dance floor, except for maybe Dance Magic Dance, I guess. And also, it's got Luck Dragons. It's got a Treyu. Like, come on, man. It's the only one of these movies that, with a single frame shot of it, can make me cry. The only thing I know is that there's some, like, aren't there some memes where, like, it's almost like they're making the giant flying dragon look inappropriate? Was like, oh. I mean, he was Ooh. inappropriate. The Luck Dragon is... Oh, so he is. He's making the kid touch him and rub him and things. <laughs> okay, that's a different movie. Oh. Let's hit the trailer. Through the ages, the powers of good and evil have been at work amongst us. Through the passages of time, many have attempted to probe and distinguish between myth and fact. What is innocence? What is purity? What is corruption? Look, ugly one horn you. What is evil? <laughs> we still search for the answer. Between the forces has captured the imaginations of civilization's greatest philosophers, poets, and writers. Judge her with your heart, not your eyes. Now, through the cameras of one of the most innovative filmmakers of our generation, comes a motion picture to fire the spirit, to excite the senses. In order to cast the world into eternal night, the Lord of Darkness sends the goblin Blix to kill the unicorns near his castle for their horns. Told by darkness that the best bait is innocence, Blix, Pox, and Blunder follow Princess Lily as she visits her Jack in the Green. In the forest, Jack teaches Lily to speak to animals, then takes her to see unicorns. When Lily holds out her hand to touch a stallion, Blix shoots it with a poison dart and the unicorns flee. Jack is angry, but Lily laughs and throws her ring into a pond, declaring oh. she'll marry whoever finds it. While Jack dives in after the ring, the goblins sever the stallion's alicorn, causing winter to descend. Lily runs off in terror, and Jack is barely able to break through the surface of the now frozen pond. So there's obviously a lot of comparisons here to Hawk the Slayer, right? You're in the same genre. It's got, you know, the same kind of a plotty kind of thing going on. It's all 80s fantasy. But unlike Hawk the Slayer, where we had the cardboard box that somebody's mom's refrigerator came in to open up this movie, this one opens up with a hell of a lot of production value. You've got this fire area, you know, Big D, you said he's being flayed. 
I don't know. If, I don't know if he was being flayed. He was being hit with a stick a couple of times for sure, repeatedly in the stomach in front of the fire. And you have a lot of like Lord of the Rings looking like orcs and goblins, all like slimy walking around. And then you got Tim Curry in a badass makeup with like a weird voice changer with his rave ready contact lenses and nails. And it's a lot, but it's like a visual feast. And I was like, okay, legend, I see you. Ash, I totally agree on this production value in the opening of the film. But before that, I was wondering if we'd have to read the whole fucking movie because Legends opening crawl felt forever long. And it's actually not. That's the crazy part. It's only 170 words, which is pretty average. It's like an average Star Wars movie opening crawl. And honestly, as the movie went on, I felt like they could have used about three more of these to tell us what the hell was going on. But if you read, Gene, that block you just read, it it sounds like a Mad Lib version for a fantasy film. Yes. Like, okay, <clears throat> so we, that's like blicks and plocks and blunder, and she's going to do what? We need an action word. Oh, throw. Okay, what is the object? She's going to throw a ring. Okay, where is she going to throw it? Um, a river? Okay, then what weather event will happen? Mm, it, it's going to be a storm, a winter storm. Yes, it'll freeze. And, and then what happens? Okay. <laughs> This shit is all over the place. And I had to remind myself that this is a fantasy film that's dark, but written almost like it is a children's book, the way they speak. And we've talked about before, we complain about the stupid Bond villain, the trope, how every villain is going to make their job much more complicated than it needs to be. Darkness on the surface. He looks badass. He looks like he's a smart guy. And he has one simple goal. One goal. Kill the last unicorn and vanquish the light forever. It's not a five-step process. Okay, step one, kill the unicorn. There is no step two. And he's got one good soldier, Blix. He's supposedly the most loathsome goblin. He's going to come in and do the job. Instead of giving him clear instructions, tell him. And, and, and Blix is like, what do I do, master? He's like, oh, I'm going to be speaking in riddles. And I'm going to read this to you. Like, oh, Blix, come closer. You summons me, my lord. Are you the most loathsome goblin? Yes, master. Are you black of heart? Yes. And then he says to me, he says, I need you to go out there. I want you to find for me the most innocent thing. out there. Oh, what does it look like, lord? And he gets pissed off at him, stabs him in the head, says, hey, take that as a clue. It's the horn. Go find him. He's like, uh, how do I find him, master? Stop speaking in riddles. It's pissing me off. Tell Blix what you want. It's a unicorn. Here's a picture. There he is. Here's how you lure him. Go out there and do it. And the movie would be over in seven minutes. Yeah, but then it wouldn't be a fantasy film. It wouldn't be a fantasy anything. Like, clearly, you're not a fan of the genre. Because to be a fantasy, you got to have a riddle or two. Like, they've got to be in there. It's why it's called a legend, because nobody really knows how it's solved. It's just kind of, like, passed down. And these aren't that bad. Like, at least, like, darkness kind of speaks in cool ones. And you got to understand, like, the juxtaposition here. You got Tim Curry, Rave, you know, darkness. And then you got Jack. And when Jack speaks, he just sounds stupid. So when he's like, you can't touch the unicorn, there's no reason why, because Jack himself does not know why. He looked like Nell. And I was not a fan at all of his character. Darkness, though, I I don't know. I liked his riddles. I thought there was a chance that he didn't speak at all. Like he was going to be have to use hand signals and he was some kind of elf. And and you said he's another idiot who's out there who's like, oh, the, the unicorns only know innocent. They've never had a dark. Lord. How the fuck do you know that, Jack? Because he's of the forest. The forest raised him and the forest birthed him. And that's how he became to be. But, you know, I'm with you and being confused here because I wasn't confused by darkness, but I was super confused from Lily and Jack. Jack, his costume I don't know if you guys have ever seen like community theater versions of Midsummer's Night's Dreams. Like he looked like a yes. community theater version of Puck. Like that is where they got his costume from. And clearly Lily, okay, she's infatuated with him, but they don't like really have conversations. He just kind of constantly looks at her with that all knowing like forest creature kind of twinkle in his eye. Like I have all the wisdom in the world type expression I'm expressing through my eyes, but my my words mean nothing. And he kisses her, you know, on the soft grass and he helps her whistle to a bird and all of that. But, but why, like, why is she with him? Are they boyfriend, girlfriend? 
Like, have they been together for a while? Did they grow up together? And then when he dives in the water, I'm like, oh, she's going to be like really concerned about him because this is her forest lover. But instead, she just like runs off and leaves him as winter descends. She's not concerned at all that clearly he's going to drown underneath this ice casing. It's all just very strange. Yeah, I had loads of questions about both of them. In particular, like, what is she the princess of, you know, and- (laughs) And what makes her so innocent? The film keeps referring to her as innocent, but I think the word they're looking for is ignorant. Like yeah. Jack is like, don't touch the unicorn. So she touches the unicorn. The unicorn gets a fucking dart in the ass and a cursed <laughs> winter is descending on the forest. And she's like, hey, I'm going to toss my ring in the water and declare a challenge for my groom. Right now, Lily, now's the time you're doing it. And then when she's visiting like the, the friendly village folk, she sabotages their clotheslines and steals biscuits. Like, how is this woman innocent? Her only defense every time is, well, I didn't know. I didn't know that was going to happen. I'm Lily. No, she's lying. <laughs> she's built this false <laughs> reputation. <laughs> she has because the innocent, the, the town folk, the woman says, hey, do you have a, a like, a, I, I don't remember what she says. It's like, do you have a lover or do you have someone who fancies you? Well, however, she said it. And she says, no, bullshit. She runs off right away to hook up. So she, no, she's full of shit. She's not innocent. So, Theoretically, there should have been no danger. The unicorn shouldn't have come near. They should have sensed that she was fucking completely wrong. That's a hoe. Yes, and those unicorns here. Now, keep in mind, Emma has phased out of My Little Pony, but that's everywhere and that I've learned about ponies. It's based on them. A cutie mark. I know that if you don't have a cutie mark, you're a blank flank, and there's three of them. I think it was Applejack, somebody else, whatever it is, but I, I know there's three distinct groups okay there was like the ones with wings the ones with horns the ones with wings and horns or earth ponies here we get in and they start using the term like like alicorn i always thought an alicorn was a pegasus with a horn you guys do D. what the what's going on in fifth edition D, you're absolutely correct right an alicorn is a pegasus with a horn it's a it's a lawful good creature it can do things like teleport and heal and stuff. I've never run into one on a campaign, but hey, Dungeon Master, if you're listening, wouldn't mind meeting an alicorn sometime. But in legend specifically, the alicorn refers to the horn on the unicorn's head. And that appears in other lore as well as, as an alicorn. But yeah, I could have just referred to it as a horn. That probably would have helped the listeners tremendously. Lily takes refuge in the cottage of a peasant family that is frozen in time. She follows the goblins to a rendezvous with darkness who tells them the world cannot be cast into eternal night as long as the surviving mare still lives. Blunder tries using the alicorn to overthrow darkness and is sent to the castle's dungeon. Meanwhile, Jack, accompanied by the forest elf Honeythorn Gump, the -the Will-o'-the-Wisp Una, the dwarves Brown Tom and Screwball, finds the mare mourning the lifeless stallion. She communicates to him that the alicorn must be recovered and returned by a great hero. So the group leaves Brown Tom to guide the unicorn while they retrieve a hidden cache of ancient weapons and armor. Sadly, Brown Tom is incapacitated by the (laughs) goblins who capture both Lily and the mare. Okay, so our young listeners out there, you you may be hearing this and you may be thinking, oh, this is delightful. Brown Tom and Blix and Gump and Screwball and Pox and Una. This is going to be something that's fun. No, this shit is darker than any of you. This is why my generation is fucked up. The Dark Crystal is like a it's like a like a puppet show fucked up in a little way. This is dark as shit. This is no labyrinth. There is no chilly down dance interlude. There is no feel good moment. This isn't even Return to Oz, Gene. When Dorothy goes into that hall of heads and the shrieking and the running and the screaming, that would give you nightmares. This is something much, much darker. This is a, a thing of pure nightmare and induces terror. Do not watch this under the influence of any mind-altering drug. There is a scene in particular where Jack, we talked about it, where, you know, it's a great idea. Let's throw the ring into the water. It freezes over. When he comes out, it is like a flashback hallucination. There is just these, like, blooms, blossoms blowing around. There's lightning. There's shrieking. There's goblins. It is the thing of nightmare. It is a bad trip. And I was getting antsy. Yeah, Ridley Scott did not need to go this hard. 
with, as you mentioned, the sweeping hard. petals, the frozen unicorn. It was like so fucking sad. And then that wet oh. goblin hair and yeah. the fucking nightmare fuel that is Meg Mucklebones. Dude, and Jack is trapped under the water and he's trying to break free. Oh, it, it's it's awful. I'm pretty sure that also Blunder yells out shit at some point. Like, I was surprised this movie was PG. You got demons either butchering or beating people. And then whatever the gump is supposed to be made me super uncomfortable. Yeah, Meg Mucklebones, I was not expecting that moment. I mean, that was very much like the birth of the orc in Lord of the Rings. Like, she, like, comes out of the forest. And, like, there was literal steam, like, coming off her back. Like, it was, that was pretty freaky. I fully expected to have like a pair of like saggy brown or yes, a pair of saggy green titties. Yeah, like hanging off the front of her. Yes, right. Like I feel like it's a weird mandala effect. Like I've seen this before, and like they she was gonna swing around and they were gonna move. Like it was really freaky. But I'll tell you, you know, you're listing all the characters here. I don't know about you guys, but Honeythorn Gump, I thought it kind of sucked. That was weird. It's creepy looking. And there's this thing that I don't like in certain fantasy things, which is, and and maybe this comes from <laughs> D&D and always being an elf my entire career of D&D. Like I'm very, very particular about my elves. Just like me being a dwarf. Yeah. But I don't like it when they make elves, these little children, these childlike things. Um, he reminded me of Mr. Tumnus from the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. James McAvoy plays him. He's like a fawn. I, I didn't like the look. And I thought the kid actor or you know, whoever played him was really terrible. There was that delivery of the line was like, you took her to see the unicorns. And then he pauses for like a good solid 30 seconds. It's like, Jack, like, it's just awful. You would think that Ridley Scott would do multiple takes over and over and over again, but he did not But where Honeythorn Gump sucks, we'll talk about Blix. Blix, Blix is not lame. Blix struts into yeah. every scene with like this really great swishy like bde walk sassy like Ooh. amazing and at this point i love the bad guys in this movie i thought honeythorn and weepy jack were nowhere near as interesting as sassy blix and darkness what do you like donald trump over here you're giving them na- like nicknames now <laughs> weepy yeah. jack poor guy <laughs> first of all honeythorn gump was played by like a guy in his twenties. That's that's the weirdest part. Of it. That's 12. the part that creamy. Yeah, he did. But much like Pan's Labyrinth, I think Legend got it right. It it made the rare move of getting mythical creatures and making them a little bit creepy. Like they should be unrelatable. They should be weird and and inhuman. Maybe even a little scary. Like I like that. It reminds me of like when you go to Coney Island. And you look at the arcades and you're like, wait, they let children play here? And there's like these scary fucking like molds surrounding the entrances. Little naked boy, drunken Irish gnome. They're all right in my book. Yeah, but they also there is like a and I know you're going to say, oh, I see it. There is some sexual tension. Everybody's thirsty in this film. Una's thirsty for <laughs> Jack. Una's thirsty for Jack. Yeah, that yes. Okay. There, there's there's hints throughout whether we got you have Lily and Jack. And also, I don't feel I don't know what what Gump is. So I'm like, what is going on here? It's it's just a weird group. It's a very weird group. It's a weird group, but Brown Tom is the standout in this movie. He's a badass. He's he's a fighter, right? I understand Lily. She's a dipshit. Like, I don't expect much from her. The unicorn mare is supposed to be this magical, majestic creature that's so elusive that you need pure innocence to bait her. So I was so <laughs> pissed off at both of them when the goblin showed up to capture the unicorn, which, which by the way, Big D, you're right. Like, why didn't you just kill her on the spot? Kill her. Why, why are they bring it back? I don't know. But I expected the mare and Lily to get the fuck out of there. But they just stand there and they're just like jumping in circles in the wind. Whoa! While Brown Tom is taking on three archers like a boss. He's got nothing but a fucking frying pan. No. Like a boss? No. Like a boss? Yes. Like a boss? Yes. You're, ki- you're, you're kidding me. Brown Tom is the fucking problem in this film. The entire team is incompetent. Hawk the Slayer. Hawk the Slayer's group. They're they're killing assassins. Those guys are like the badass of compared to these guys. Brown Tom, he did not defend with his pan. He was fucking around, showing his ass, doing but but b- between the the his legs with the frying pan. If he took it seriously and just went, oh, I'll defend you, and he started swatting them away, 
it would have been great. But instead, he's playing around. At the end, who falls asleep and almost invites permanent darkness? Who? Who of all of our great adventures, brown fucking Tom, can't even stay awake? Yeah, he was tired from defending against all those arrows. No, and what about that whole speech? You talked about it, Ash, right? So you get the moment, Jack, what have you done? You've touched the unicorn. And then it breaks into when they find out that he's got a girlfriend. They're pulling out drinks. They're having fun. They're not focused on what's going on. That's their nature. They're elves and dwarves. They're they're forest and fey folk, right? So like they're like as soon as they hear the word love, they're like, hey, listen, what you did is pretty fucked up, but also love's pretty sweet. Let's have some elderberry wine. Okay, so I want to roll back my earlier statement. <laughs> darkness is not competent. Gene, if I put you in the role of darkness, I yeah. put you in your dark lair mm-hmm. under the ground. Yeah. I gave you Blix. I'll give yeah. you Blix and two or three other goblins and trolls, whatever. Okay. How long would it take you to accomplish your one goal? Dude, I would just come out at night and fuck everybody's shit up. Who's going to stop you? Who's going to stop me? Who? This band of, of you said, merry little creatures? They're no. not going to stop you. Yeah. The other thing is, like, wh- like, everybody's hanging out in his forest, technically. And nobody should know, hey, those unicorns are important. Let's all protect them. Let's get them out of here. <laughs> Let's get them far away. <laughs> Big D, you mentioned earlier that uh, I was a and d enthusiast. Ash has mentioned her uh, D&D love of being an elf. I love two things a lot in this world that I don't do nearly enough. One is D&D, one is playing video games. And both of those involve loot. And I am a fucking sucker for adventure loot. And every great fantasy film has it, whether it's the glaive in Crawl or the mind sword or the fist sword in Hawk or the weirding module in Dune. We've covered a lot of movies that have these legendary weapons that you have to go on some sort of a quest to get. In Legend, Jack is chosen as the champion, and they send him on a quest to gain weapons and armor so he can fight darkness. I'm like, fuck yeah, let's go. Like, What does he got to do? He's got to solve a riddle, or is he got to fight something, or like survive a perilous journey? No, the quest consists of going to a tree and then picking <laughs> up the weapons and armor. Which are totally underwhelming. It looks like he took his like mom's sequin dress and just like any random ass sword from a Halloween store. And then he sort of just leaves the sword and shield behind as soon as he gets to Darkness's lair. Like he doesn't even think he's going to have to have a fight. No, and sadly, I think that's a reoccurring theme is that everything they acquire, it's it's easy. It doesn't take any effort. It's almost as if it's like the first level of Zelda. Hey, here's your sword. You get the sword. Then you go to the first board and then, okay, you start to see the bad guys and then you'll go and get loot. It You almost have to level up from the, from the, like the zero level and the music. This film has two independent scores that they changed. The one that they went with for the theatrical release, I felt like it was a video game. It was Zelda. There was a lot of like pan flute. There was synthesizers. It was really simple. And it was, it was, they were dumbing it down. Cause if, if our heroes don't have to overcome to gain an advantage, I just feel like it really was never a danger or a hard thing to do. Well, upon returning, Jack and his group make their way to Darkness's castle. On the way, they are attacked by a swamp hag called Meg Mucklebones, but Jack defeats her by flattering her appearance and then decapitating her. At the castle, Jack's group falls into an underground prison cell where they encounter Blunder, who is revealed to be a dwarf gone astray before he is dragged off by an ogre to be baked into a pie. Una, who is secretly a fairy, retrieves the keys to free the others. So I've already mentioned that I think the acting in this movie is a bit questionable. Um, even Tom Cruise like clearly had no clue yet what he was doing other than just kind of squinting a lot and kind of tilting his head to the left way too often. But I think that while it's a hodgepodge of a lot of, you know, different fantasy films and it gets lost a bit in the sense, like where like the plot just feels very, very cookie cutter. One thing that sets this movie apart is the set design. The set design in this movie is absolutely beautiful. The world that Ridley Scott creates is pretty amazing. You know, we've talked about the Meg Mucklebone scene. You know, that swamp scene is beautifully shot. Like the monsters are so cool looking. All of the makeup, the costume design, other than the armor that Jack finds. Other than that, like it looks really fantastic and it looks really expensive. Like I can't imagine what their budget 
budget was for makeup alone. Um, and I think that that's what's interesting about this. And and it kind of clicked for me. Maybe that's why people love it so much is that like anytime you pause this movie, it looks like this beautiful painting or this beautiful picture. So that has to be maybe why it stuck around. Because anytime anyone opened their mouths, I was like, oh, but when they were quiet and just kind of like walking through the world, like it was kind of about us. Yeah, it's classic Ridley Scott visuals. When Lily is running through that grand hall, the blue glitter hall in Darkness's castle, and she's being followed by Una, you really felt like you could have been an alien or Blade Runner. It's just that blue tone in a dark, vast space and like a dreamlike quality. I, I agree. This movie just looks great. Yeah, it's something he does. Like Even if you look at his new stuff, like Prometheus, a lot of the stuff you could do digitally – he insists on going back and building sets. He makes his life very difficult, but it shows. It is a beautiful film. But I kept asking myself, what was the audience? Who are you making this film for? There's no puppets. There's no fun. Like, <laughs> go- yeah, yeah, we have our merry band, but they're still a bit dark. Is it for adults who love fantasy? Is it for a family to go together? It's inappropriate for kids. And there was famously like 15 rewrites. It was it was all over the place. It was for the English who felt let down by Hawk. No, no Englishmen of a certain age were let down by Hawk. Hawk was a great film. But I think the reason why also you're asking how it had such longevity. I think it's about one thing, one person, one character. When you see the poster, you see darkness. It is this oversized villain. It is an incredible prosthetic. It's an incredible performance. And it is a legendary Tim Curry. And I had talked to Ash yesterday. I'm embarrassed to say I did not know this was him. He is buried under all this makeup. And after I saw Tim Curry in uh, in, in Rock Horror Picture Show, Gene, with you and Sarah, I started, it opened up my love for Tim Curry. I'd always known him as Pennywise, but now going and seeing even Clue, I understand why everybody loves him. He gives a performance that was the only reason I liked this film. I kept waiting for him to come back. I'm like, fuck, okay, here we are with the fairies and the gnomes and the above. I want to see what's going on down below. And a lot of times when people have these prosthetics on and you think we were going back to what was it? The the Masters of the Universe. Wasn't it Frank Langella who played Skeletor? Some of his performance crept out of the eyes and the mouth here. He is emoting. Tim Curry brings this character to life. He's buried under the... Those horns are ridiculous. They're oversized. They're way too big for that outfit, but he makes it work. And in that scene where he's trying to seduce Lily, and she says, I have one wish, and then I'll be with you. And he's like, oh, what is it? Like, you, I could feel him being aroused. He brought that character to life. <laughs> And not expected to go there. <laughs> Me either. Um, I, I can tell you that I'm in complete agreement with you. I would watch this man in literally anything. Let's not forget Tim Curry is the person who made Congo worth watching. And that's saying a lot because that movie's terrible. I think he's an incredible. I think he's such a good bad guy. Like whenever he's a bad guy, I think that he's at his best. Um, and so whether he's like the homicidal butler in Clue or he's, you know, the Prince of Darkness, basically in this movie, he's wonderful and you can't help but watch him when he's on screen. Um, he's got such physicality in a way that a lot of these other actors just don't. You just had me. I just, you just, sorry. You just gave me a flashback here. Congo. Is that Amy? Amy hungry. Amy, Amy scared. Jungle. Amy scared. <laughs> Amy sleep. Amy need martini. Ugly lady. Ugly, ugly lady. And I'll never understand this about directors and and filmmakers. You've got Tim Curry. Let's say the script didn't involve that much of darkness, but you got Tim Curry. Show more Tim Curry. Like we don't need to be doing all this other stuff because this movie takes its sweet ass time with everything else but Tim Curry. And I'm a notoriously slow person. Like my sister begged my mom to put me in Velcro shoes because I would make her late for school, tying my shoelaces. My mom nicknamed me slow-mo as a child. And I still, to this day, I can literally see Sarah getting irritated when we're getting ready to leave the house. And I just, all I can say is sorry world, like genius comes at a price. But even I was annoyed by how slowly the heroes operate in this film. Like there's a point where Blunder, who turns out to be a dwarf, is dragged off to certain death. 
He's like screaming. Everybody's hiding. The jailer, I'm pretty sure, even like leaves the fucking. He's getting. He's screaming. The you can see him going toward the fire. And Una decides that is the time that she wants to ask Jack for a kiss. And then Jack struggles with this request for an I'm like, dude, just fucking kiss her. Like, let's go. Your life depends on it. Everybody's life depends on it. Blunder is about to die. And he's like, oh, you just don't explain how. You just don't understand how human hearts work, dude. She's. A fairy that looks like Yolandi from the Antwoord. Like, just kiss that little winged hottie. And from there, we get this <laughs> metal platter frisbee scene. Yes. It's like another five minutes of people just like, ho ho! And they're throwing a frisbee, dwarves throwing platters to one another. And by the way, just as a reminder, I watched the theatrical cut. Gene, it's the last moment. It's the last moment to get light down there and save the day. And these fucking knuckleheads are playing shenanigans. There's two sleeping. You have the sleeping pig guy and the guard. They're going around and just whacking each other like the Three Stooges. I want the world <laughs> to go to darkness. I want to watch all of these guys be like, what have we done to, dis- to deserve this? You fucking idiots couldn't do your one job. Get the plates and be quiet. Darkness, touched by Lily's innocence, releases her to wander the castle. He leaves lavish gifts for her, including an enchanted dancing dress that hypnotizes her. When he asks her to marry him, Lily agrees on the condition that she will be the one to kill the mayor in the upcoming ritual. Overhearing their conversation, Jack and Gump learn darkness can be destroyed by daylight. After saving Blunder, the group takes the ogre's giant metal platters as makeshift mirrors to reflect sunlight into the chamber where the mayor is to be sacrificed. So you talked about Mad Libs, right? That it sounds like this plot was created by a big old Mad Lib for fantasy movies. Never is that more true than like, okay, the lavish gift that is going to get her, what is it going to be? Okay, we need like a verb. Okay, dancing. You know, we need a noun, dress. And that's what it is. It's a dancing dress, right? It's a hypnotic dancing dress. Not on my list. But I thought the scene was hilarious. The way she starts like mimicking its movement. And then like she's getting hot and bothered and her hair starts getting all frizzy. And then she folds into it. And what does she do? She wakes up as goth Lily with like that neck piece that comes up behind her. And she's like, no. To with darkness, you know, and, and did anyone else notice that like clearly Hellboy was a ripoff of Tim Curry in this movie? Because for a second, I was like, is that Ron Perlman? Because it looked just like Hellboy and he's germinating his darkness in her. I was laughing out loud. So, Ash, clearly this scene was for the boys because I appreciated every minute of it. And this was like an Alexander McQueen wet dream. Like, how else is darkness going to seduce Lily other than a dancing dress? You want him to do a little dance? You want him to, like, neg her? Yes. Should he ask her what types of kisses are appropriate at an English wedding? I mean, no, I'm not saying he should be Carrie from Four Weddings. But I think that the problem here is just that. I don't know. Maybe it's the fact that when they shot it, they didn't take the time to figure out how to like rig the dress up on, I don't know, like fishing line and spin it around. Instead, there's clearly another actress in the dress that every time it turns too quickly to the left, like you can see the person in the dress that I thought was a little. See, but the bigger problem is what's her motivation? When she's meeting with her like country, her simple folk fans, they say, how aren't you going to be a lady? It makes it sound like she comes from money, right? She's a princess. You're going to lure her with like silver and jewels. She's got that shit coming out of her ass. You should lure her with like the the, the temptation of darkness. You don't know what it's like. Her power. This felt like Ray in whatever the stupid Jedi film was, where she sees the reflection of her <laughs> dark self, and then she has the red bladed lightsaber. It was stupid. Just tempt her with that. She seems like she's got it in there. And I've never been, you know, Gene, I've never been like the goth, emo girl i've never thought they were attractive i thought they were always kind of dirty and dark when they weren't even necessary it's not my (laughs) cup of tea but i gotta say lily mia sarah that is uh that is sloan from ferris bueller's day off that's ferris's girlfriend she is stunning the dark princess is much better than her original look and this movie as much as i said it was gonna be thirsty it could have been much worse there was a point where they had scenes where he would kind of neg her darkness, he would torment her, she would love it, and then they would have a scene where they actually had violent relations. 
during Scott's first pitch of this film to the Fox executive, Marcia Nassiter, she specifically said, you cannot have a villain fuck the princess. You cannot do that. That's where this movie was going, and I would have been all for it, Gene. This is why you need women in the boardroom right here. Marcia Nassiter, you can't have the villain fuck the princess. Big D, I was worried. While we were watching this, I thought we might find out why the goblins refer to darkness as Big D. (laughs) Speaking of which, have you guys seen like CGI monster porn? Have you seen this genre of porn? I, I, I believe I have. Okay, Ash, so I didn't know this existed. I was curious about, I'd been hearing about the sex scene from Baldur's Gate 3. Yes. And so I'm looking for that and I stumbled upon Skyrim porn. And like someone took the time to, there's like five minute scenes where there's like, like three, you know, orcs or ogres or something like that are like gang banging a chick or there's like a vampire chick who's like torturing, you know, a Skyrim warrior or something like that. And it's hopefully none of them are goths so they don't look dirty for Big D. Right? Yeah, I wouldn't want them to fuck a dirty goth. Jesus. Oh, wait. Okay. Sky. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. how Meaty and Lydia should have gone. So Lydia is a vampire in a uh, spoiler alert in Skyrim. How's this for a passport? And she grabs his dick. Okay, so listen, before I get any hate mail here, what I mean is it doesn't always, the goth and emo look doesn't look like it's well kept. It seems like a, a thrown together outfit. It, it I, A couple of things. Maybe you've experienced like Florida goths. I'm not really sure. Swamp goths. A, a, a Swamp part goths. of the goth ritual, a part of the ritual is the hours before you go out where you're all hanging out, drinking in front of the mirror, listening to music, getting ready to go, smoking cloves, and then finally go to the club. You spend arguably more time getting dressed than you do actually at the club. But Big D, just by my count here, it's not just the goths that you need to apologize to in this episode. It's Star Wars fans. It's yeah. D&D fans. I'm not sure who else you got emo. in there. But emo kids. <laughs> He's on a tear. Skyrim porn characters. <laughs> no, I'm not the one who's Googling that right now. Lily. You better, hope, yeah, you better wipe your browser history before you give that phone to your kids, Ash. They have they have their own devices for this reason. I, I just don't understand why anybody finds this appealing. I just don't understand who makes it. Like, what's the idea behind making it? I love the name, though. Lord Vampire Fucked Girl with Big Ass. I'm going to use that line on Sarah later tonight. Hey, Lord Vampire Fucks Girl with Big Ass. As the ritual begins, Lily tries to free the mare, and darkness knocks Lily out. Jack's group redirects the setting sun with the platters as he fights darkness, finally wounding him with the stallion's alicorn right before the redirected sunlight shines into the room, blasting darkness to the edge of the eternal void. Darkness warns them that because evil lurks in all beings, he will never truly be vanquished. Gump then returns the stallion to life by magically reattaching its alicorn. With the stallion reunited with the mare, winter suddenly ends. and Jack retrieves Lily's ring from the pond, placing it on her finger, wakening her from darkness's spell. So I get that darkness is the big bad in this movie. And I get that, yes, he kind of caused eternal night and a magical winter to befall on the, the people and all that stuff. But at the end, I couldn't help but feel bad for him. Like, I don't know that they had to banish darkness into the void, right? He was just being himself. Like, if you th- analyze what he actually wanted in this world, Big D, he wanted to be able to go outside anytime he liked. He's allergic to, to daylight. He wanted someone to love him in Lily. And you can see from the beginning of the film, as you mentioned with his rave nails and his contact, he's just a guy who's very bored and very extra. Right, The way he moves, the way he talks, his giant wine glasses, it's all just very, very. Meanwhile, Jack and Lily, they get everything. They get to be in love. They get the waterfalls. They get the forest creatures. They get soft grass and normal-sized wine goblets. I really felt like it wasn't fair to darkness. All of this. This whole story sucked. Yeah, I kind of feel, I kind of feel bad for him. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's the problem here with this entire film, though. You just like kind of hit on the head, which is that... Who the fuck cares about Lily and Jack, right? Like, darkness is the only one that's interesting. So when you banish the only interesting character, then, like, you banish the point of me watching the film. And I think that Ridley Scott just didn't get that. Like, he wasn't ready to lean into, you know, what his character looked like. And maybe, I don't know, I mean, write in, those of you who saw this in the 80s. Because, like, let's let's admit here like darkness is a little draggy right like there's a lot of drag about him 
And I was surprised he wanted to be with Lily because like, I don't know if that's like his thing. And I, I think that, you know, that's the problem is in the 80s when you watch this, like, did it read differently? Because we as a society, like, didn't read into that stuff. Like, did he look like just like your typical bad guy? Or did he look more like what we see him as today, which I think is a hell of a lot more interesting. But maybe in the 80s, like that just like, you know, kind of got swept under the rug. Well, if you think about it, the pressure's really coming from his dad. So, like, maybe yeah. Lily's his beard. Maybe. I can't believe I'm going to say this. I think this would work as a musical. <laughs> I honestly do. because, And I don't know if it's the Rocky Heart. It, it, picture Darkness doing a number where he's, like, professing his love and his confusion and about his father, like you're just saying. A, a musical number in that outfit would be great. Isn't that just Hercules? No. 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 And I, And I think it all goes back to... They didn't know who this movie was for. The, it, is it for kids? The you know the studio didn't know. Scott didn't know. And there's, it, there, we've had a couple times recently where we were talking about multiple versions of films. When I sat down to watch this and I saw two hours, I was like, oh, fuck. And then thankfully I realized, I was like, let me make sure that this is not the, that this is the correct theatrical version. No, it was the director's version. So thankfully... But this isn't Blade Runner. This isn't Apocalypse Now. This was the first film where I feel like it was really disjointed. I could feel all the different pieces that were missing, where there were some relationships. There, there was some dialogue that was that was that was not there. Because what we watched was the theatrical original, which I think was like 90 minutes. The director's was 113 minutes. And then there was an edited version down for network TV that had something with the crawl and there's a European version. But this is the first one of all of them that felt disjointed. And I thought it hurt the overall product at the end. And you could he feel that there was no audience. I'm not surprised it didn't make money and it failed. Who's going to watch this commercial and say, I want to go see that? Who? Except for those people who are now watching erotic like cartoons. That's the audience, and I wish. Write in, please, and tell me, would the extra 30 minutes make a difference? I definitely could have saved myself some time if I had watched the European version, which I understand is a few minutes longer than the American version, but it showed a mask that represented Darkness's father, and that would have helped me a lot because I had to rewind the film a few times because it kept saying, like, father, and then there was a screen showing something. So I'm like, is he? Is it dark? Do I not see him? And I'm searching the screen for where father was only to finally decide, okay, darkness is, I don't know, talking to the fire. It, it turns out, no, there was a mask that was above the fireplace in the European version that he's talking to. And it doesn't like, it's not animated or anything, but like you at least get that he's speaking to this dark mask. And so it kind of leads some people to believe that his father is either Satan or like father or, or like fire or some sort of chaos agent um, rather than, you know, me looking for a tiny man in a chair somewhere. But in the end, Ridley Scott just decides to reuse the final shot of alien with the sky background <laughs> as they're ejecting the xenomorph into space. That's not where I imagine that darkness would go to suffer. It's flying out into space between those two giant rocks. I mean, maybe, you know, he'll finally get to be his own person. Again, another musical <laughs> number could have been great. He, he appears in a blissful, like a utopian heaven. And he's singing about how yeah. he likes it. Kind of like Olaf saying about enjoying summer in Frozen. Yeah, very Buffy, yeah. right? Like where like he always is like, where do we go from here? And then, like, I mean, that would match so perfectly with Jack and all of them. Walk hand in hand, but we'll walk alone in fear. Be great. See, Big D, this is where we draw other fan bases into the podcast yeah. rather than pushing them away. Well, now it's the time of the podcast to give our wipe score for Legend. The chat score is our way of telling you how many wipes this movie takes to get off your respective butts. Zero wipes is a perfect movie. It's unicorns. And Five Wipes is an absolute disaster movie. It is glitter on everything. Ash, we'll start with you. What is your wipe score for Legend? This is a weird one. Like, as eye candy, it's zero wipes, right? Like, it's gorgeous. But I think that Ridley and his team were much more interested in the look than the actual movie. Because it's messy. It's absolutely ridiculously acted. And unlike Hawk, this movie takes itself so fucking seriously. Like, it thinks it is a, a drama. And because of that, it's just not fun. Also, we didn't mention the end. 
any movie that ends with slow motion hand waving that fades into a sunset automatically gets another wipe, like boom just gets added on there. So I went back and forth on this one and I'm actually going to change my wipe score. Normally I get easier on my wipe score as I go because with you guys, like I remember it and I have more fun because like talking about it with you guys is more fun. But in talking with you tonight, it actually made me like, like the movie less. So I was going to give it 3.75 wipes. I'm going to give it a solid four. This one's going to be a four for me. Not great. Not beautiful. Hawk the Slayer at least was fun and funny. This one, it just kind of was wah wah. Tim Curry, you deserve better. I totally agree. I recently guested on an episode of the Cinematic Underdogs podcast. Uh, Everybody go check it out. And one of the hosts mentioned being a massive Ridley Scott fan. And I asked if he'd ever seen Legend and he hadn't. I, I firmly believe you cannot decide whether you like Ridley Scott until you've seen this disappointment of a fantasy film. Uh, it made me wish for anything else really Scott has done, even something as recent Big D as 2012's Prometheus. Uh, 4.25 <laughs> wipes oh, for me. You son of a bitch. That, that's, that's a low blow. Yes. Okay. That, that was, wow. Okay. So I can't believe I'm going to be the voice of reason here. I, you, listen, the final result is a mess, but you said it, Ash. It's beautiful. I think the performances are good. I think this is the the case of like what we're getting today, where studios get involved in the final product, where a director, the writers, they all have their own vision. And I think it maybe at this point, Scott wasn't strong enough to put his vision until the director's cut came out. But I feel in here, there's a good film. Gene, if you were at the club and they were playing this on the wall with no sound, wouldn't you be mesmerized yeah. at what you see? Yes. I think Ash has established the music. The movie's beautiful. Yeah. So for that, the performances for Tim Curry for Darkness, I got to go two point five wipes. This is not worse than that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry for Darkness. Guy. For Darkness, we're giving this an yes. average score. Oh. Yes. <laughs> what do you want? Yes. Hmm. It's a quality film. It's a quality movie. Listen, it was put together. It was quality. This is, I think this is as good as Labyrinth. I don't know what I gave Labyrinth. Labyrinth is so much fun, though. This one's such a bummer. It's just a bummer of a film. Big D, I'd just like to remind you that you gave Blade Runner, another Ridley Scott film, which is beautiful world building, beautiful effects, incredible costuming. Well, I was an amateur at that point. (gasps) That That was before I had something to compare it to. I don't think that is. I, I've said that's an injustice. What did he give Hawk the Slayer? Hawk the Slayer was good. Yeah, I think he I gave it. What did you give a big D? Like yeah, two? Yeah, it was better than this. Yeah, Hawk two. the Slayer. Yeah. Was, and Hawk the oh Slayer was God. made by a group of people who had no money and no business making that film. That was a fun film. I would love to go out to a restaurant with Big D. Like, dude, I know this <laughs> great place. These people have no business making food <laughs> and horrible ingredients. You're going to love if it. If they try real hard, I'll... They tried, they tried really, really, hard. really hard. I'll be like, you know what? I'd give them a chance. Well, thanks, Carlos and Natasha, for exposing us uh, to Legend. And thankfully, Darkness didn't expose himself. If you would like to check out some of Ash's curated uh, monster porn, please visit shadpod.com and take a look. Now's the time for some voicemail and email we got this week. And the first voicemail comes from Jackson, who's calling in about Close Encounters. Hello, Shack crew. This is Jackson. Uh, This would be my third movie commission. I am commissioning Close Encounters of the Third Kind. How this movie hasn't been reviewed yet is beyond me. But I'm looking forward to whenever it gets added to the schedule. It's the first Steven Spielberg movie I ever watched. And that's including Jurassic Park. I'm not sure how that happened, but It is one of my favorite Steven Spielberg movies and my introduction to Richard Dreyfuss. I would love to see what you guys think of the movie, and I know you guys are going to love it. You've probably seen it a dozen times. But um, hope you guys will do it, and uh, keep doing what you guys are doing. Love you guys. 
I am so excited. I love this movie. And I am excited to go from like fantasy to true sci-fi. I think this one could be really cool. Although, I mean, Big D, the set designs aren't that great. So you may not give it as high of a wipe score as um, as Legend. But I, I think it's badass. I say, yes, 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 yes. Please, can we do it? Please. Jackson, you might be surprised by this. I have not seen this film dozens of times. <gasps> and in fact, I once again got this movie confused with batteries not included. So I've never seen Close Encounters at all. I have seen batteries not included about a dozen times. Hmm. How do you get those mixed up? Uh, they're like from outer space or something and lights. I mean, do you also get cocoon mixed up with these movies? Uh, yes, actually. Now that you mention it, I thought that cocoon isn't. Oh, that's Wilford Brimley. Yeah. Is cocoon. It's the, yeah. the beat. Is. Yeah. I also cocoon's got a pool. Yes. There's a pool. I don't know. I don't remember. I just remember they're old and they die. Yes, they, or they don't no, there's die. There's an alien like, like rock or like it looks like mork and mindy like the the, the big egg <laughs> nano nano yes. uh and there is a pool like a community pool at a retirement home that the alien egg is in and when the people go swimming like wilford brimley he he does not have the beaties any the beatus he, he's they're running around they're frolicking and the, all the people become young again yeah and i that's another steve gutenberg under underappreciated like male of his body gene whoo Steve Gutenberg, ladies, check it out. Well, Jackson, I hope you enjoyed your free uh, <laughs> review of Cocoon. Uh, we apparently loved it and uh, Steve Gutenberg's body. Uh, thanks so much for calling in. It sounds like we will do Close Encounters, so let's get that scheduled. Hey. Next up, we have an email from Kevin in Albany, New York. Ash, if you'll do the honors, it's called How to Lose a Longtime Listener. Kevin wrote in and said, hey, Shaq crew, I've been a longtime listener of the pod Back to the Roger era and have loved the series. Sadly, after Gene's unnecessary comments on the Elf episode about police officers, I find that my time with the pod has come to an end. Yes, Gene, the pod and microphone are yours to say what you want. But as a self-declared social justice warrior, I would think you would know the dangers of collectively categorizing a group of people based on the actions of a small few. I wish you all the best. Kevin in Albany, New York. Well, Kevin, I want to start off by saying thank you so much for listening to the pod. If you're still listening, uh, I hope that you uh, uh, will take this to heart. But uh, essentially, um, I don't see the police as a group of people. Uh, they get to choose what they do for a living. And I find the occupation itself, uh, if you can't recognize that it is a bastardly thing to do uh, and decide to do it, then I've got issues with you. Now, I do know police officers. I I, I, I train with some uh, at the gym. I have some that I've hung out with before. And uh, if a cop can admit that the job that they do is a shitty thing to do, then I'm fine with that. But otherwise, yeah, uh, I you know I don't know. That's again, it's my take. It doesn't represent the entire podcast, but I believe all cops are bastards, and I'll openly say it. So sorry that my opinion on one particular thing makes you not want to listen to the podcast, but. Um, yeah, I I have no respect for police. So listen, my father hates certain groups of people. <laughs> that goes without saying. Yeah, but no, that's no, a you're, race. You're what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, <laughs> I don't understand why anyone would stop listening. Did your opinion, Gene? Did it hurt them so much that they couldn't tolerate it? What I'm trying to say is, your opinions—they're your opinions. I, I, if I don't agree with them, I can just turn it off. I don't know why somebody would be so upset that they would go away. Well, I mean, I think Kevin is turning it off. That's his point. And, and I get where Kevin's coming from, because if there was a podcast I was listening to and they're like, hey, all women are stupid, I would say, OK, well, I'm not listening to this podcast anymore. This podcast is bullshit. Right. But if it was like, hey, um, oh, here's the take. Right. OK. If I'm watching a movie and it's like journalists are scum. Right. I as a journalist or marketers are scum. Right. As a former journalist and a current marketer, I go, yeah, yeah, you're right. We are scummy. Like that is. That's the nature of the business. It's what we do. Uh, or, you know, Big D, as you and I discussed earlier tonight, True Detective, when Russ Cole says, you know, that we're bad men and and the world needs bad men to keep other bad men at bay. Okay, I can accept that too. But you got to admit that you're bad. Well, I'm going to have to check because this might be a code word. Somebody, Because one of my, my friends who is an Albany cop, John M., he's up there and he was a narcotics officer for years. If him and his wife, Beth, who are also Albany police, this might be them. 
All right, well, the next one comes in from Jeremiah, and Jeremiah says, Hi, Shack Crew. I'm writing again to see about the status of payback. It's a really good Mel Gibson flick that I wanted to commission. Big D gave the nod in an email. I sent the money, but it's not on the calendar. It's one that's particularly hard to find. So I understand if y'all can't do it, happy to have donated to the pod anyway. And that again comes from Jeremiah. Uh, and Jeremiah, I apologize. The plugin that I use to pull movies uh, has had an issue. It hasn't been updated in quite a while. So they're trying to get a patch for it. So I have a batch of movies I have to add, have not been able to. Uh, I will, if I cannot get the plugin to work, I will do it manually. Well, the next one comes from Nathaniel and it's entitled Ash. And Nathaniel says, I've been listening for years and I've never sent any correspondence before. But I have to say, I audibly cheered in my mail truck when I heard that Ash was back for Eternal Sunshine. And all my podcast listening, I've never missed a voice or perspective like I have hers. Yay. And again, that comes from Nathaniel O. And Nathaniel, thanks so much. Um, it, uh, I have to say just in general, the amount of people who have reached out across all the different platforms, whether it's Twitter or Instagram or uh, in Discord or, you know, however, um, through emails, it's been really, really sweet. Um, other than the two assholes who at the same time on the same day said they're not listening anymore because I came back and killed the show. I apologize to the two of you who I think are the same person because again, the reviews came in at exactly the same time. But <laughs> that being said, the rest of you guys have been absolutely wonderful. So um, it's nice to talk with you again. And um, yeah, it's very sweet. And it's definitely been huge to have Ash back on the pod, uh, aside from just giving us that old chemistry uh, back again, which we which we really, really uh, value. Also, Ash has taken on editing duties. Uh, so she most recently just did uh, forwarding scene funeral and did a fantastic job uh, on that one. So as we work through this incredible backlog of films that you've all so generously commissioned. It's so helpful to have all three of us firing on all three cylinders uh, and making this thing easier for everyone involved. Totally agree. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't realize how much time and effort it really takes and how much it takes up. It's like, Oh, that's such a cute little hobby, but it's like a second job. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, And so I think that, um, the reason why, I mean, obviously I adore these two guys here tremendously, but um, it's because of all you guys that we, you know, get on and, and do this. So um, we're appreciative to each of you. All right. Thanks, Ash. Big D, what do we have coming up next week? Gene, next week's film isn't the warm, you know, glow of a retirement home pool as like a an alien rock has fallen into it or a mountain of mashed potatoes and kids just being like, daddy, where are you going? And music. It's the dark side of aliens. It's the aliens that want to come and put stuff in your ass. In 1975, a group of five men are driving home after work in the forest when they see a mysterious light. Intrigued, Travis leaves his truck only to be sucked up into a flying saucer. The other four men report the strange event, but they are skeptically investigated by Lieutenant Frank Waters, who suspects that murder is behind Walton's disappearance. When Walton reappears five days later, his story of alien abduction is met with disbelief. This is again from uh, Carlos and Natasha, came out in 93. And this will be interesting to revisit because this scared me back in the day to go out in the dark roads. Yeah, um, as a child who uh, grew up in Arizona with Strawberry and Heber just like down the road, uh, this one freaked me out a lot. I'm really, really hoping that I can actually like bury those fears um, after watching it uh, again as an adult and maybe having a laugh at it instead of nightmares. Thank you, Carlos and Natasha for the commission. And thank you to all the commissioners who make this podcast possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shout the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shout the Movies. You can email us, host at shatpod.com. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, buying our merch, or by commissioning your own movie. You can find all that information on our website, shatpod.com. Also, check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, Watchmen, and True Detective. And by the way, we are not covering True Detective Night Country, but we certainly are watching it. So if you'd like to hang out with us on our Discord, uh, there's lots of discussion there. You can find all the information on our website, shatpod.com slash TV, wherever we find podcasts to be found, including Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by Apple Podcasts, please leave a five-star review. It helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-host, Ash Big D, I'm Gene Lyons. Join us next week for the following movie.
How does it think? What makes it move? Why does it breathe? Questions anyone would ask about a man if they'd never seen one before. So for five days, a man was borrowed. The story that Travis Walton and five other witnesses told was so unbelievable, so unimaginable, that it has become the most famous case of UFO abduction ever reported. Thank you.